In today's video, we're talking about prostate MRIs. We get a lot of questions in our comment section, so today we're sitting down with Dr. Mark Scholz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused solely in prostate cancer. And we're gonna cover questions like, what is the difference between PSMA and MRI, and should I be getting a PSMA first? What is the power of an MRI and the information it can tell me? Should I get a second opinion on it? And so much more. I hope you find this helpful. So thanks to our channel in the comment section, we get many questions. And today we're gonna to be talking about MRIs. You know, we get a lot of questions from all over the world regarding this. And so we're gonna start off with the basis of what an MRI is. I think a lot of people are, tend to be familiar with the term, but they don't know exactly what it does and the scope of what the MRI covers when it comes to the prostate. Well, MRIs are used for the whole body, but they got repurposed for prostate imaging 10 years ago. It was always hard for MRIs to delineate the tumor uh, as opposed to the prostate gland itself because prostate cancer being a low-grade tumor is very similar to prostate tissue. And so there were some new techniques that were developed to finally help the tumor light up more in the background of the prostate. This obviously is very revolutionary technology when it first came out. We have sort of jumped in with both feet once the studies showed that in head-to-head -head trials that MRIs were even better than biopsies in finding cancer. We abandoned abandon random biopsies at that point and use MRIs to find the tumor and then do targeted biopsies to, to confirm or refute if the abnormality seen on the MRI is a high grade lesion that needs attention. So when it comes to the MRI itself and lymph nodes, for instance, you know, does it only see pelvic lymph nodes when they're doing a prostate MRI or do they see abdominal lymph nodes? How far are they covering in the body? It's very, not even the whole pelvis. When you do a MRI of the prostate, it's really focused on the prostate itself. There's some surrounding area in the pelvic area picked up on the MRI and they may see an enlarged lymph node, but uh, MRIs, CAT scans and the like are not that great at finding early stage cancer spreading to the lymph nodes. That's for PSMA PET scans or Aximan PET scans, choline PET scans. The problem being is that the tumor in the lymph node has to be big enough so that the lymph node starts to swell up. And uh, that's a, a more advanced stage of cancer in the lymph nodes, whereas these PET scans didn't, can detect smaller amounts. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September we're having an in-person prostate cancer patient and caregivers conference. It's a great way for you to get your questions answered in person with Dr. Scholz and our team. And you can find out more at PCRI.org. Also, click that subscribe button because when you do this, it helps us out quite a lot. And if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at PCRI.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. Back in the day, about 10 years ago, we would hear about 1.5 Tesla versus 3T MRIs. And, you know, I think internationally, I still see a lot of people are maybe only have access to a 1.5 Tesla. And they're kind of wondering if this is all I have access to, is it still good enough? So can you talk about the differences in the magnets between these machines? Well, you're just trying to get clear pictures. And uh, you get a clearer picture with a 3 Tesla magnet. In the old days when this first started up, they were using 1.5 Tesla magnets and they were uh, mating it with a endorectal coil. So this is a way to get closer to the prostate by putting a device in the rectum during the MRI, which is very uncomfortable. Useful information can be ascertained with 1.5 Tesla imaging. It has value, but uh, three Tesla imaging is definitely superior. You know, you mentioned the endorectal coil. Do we ever see that being used in today's world with 3T MRIs? And is there ever a time when it is necessary in maybe specific cases? Not that I'm aware of. Because they're so uncomfortable, they're very discouraging. If people have an endorectal coil, they often will refuse to ever have an MRI again. It's really an antiquated approach that we don't use anymore. So I've seen in the comments time and time again when we talk about MRIs, we talk about contrast as well, and gadolinium tends to come up often. Um, and some people seem to have a reaction to gadolinium, and there's been some studies that you know are currently uh, in the works regarding that. But do you ever see issues with gadolinium? And first of all, just how does a contrast work? It sharpens the images up a little bit, so the doctors have a little more confidence in trying to describe what's going on. There are such things as gadolinium allergies, they're very rare. The bigger concern, which hasn't really been established to be a medical concern, but emotional concern, is that gadolinium can linger in the body afterwards, and, and there have been questions raised as to whether there might be long-term repercussions. Uh, so far, nothing has ever been demonstrated, but there are people who are perhaps very conservative and want to avoid the gadolinium, and it is feasible to do pretty decent three Tesla MRIs without gadolinium. So for those that are particularly nervous about it, 
they can consider doing the MRI without gadolinium. So when it comes to these magnets in these MRI machines, is there ever an issue if somebody has a hip replacement or any metal in the area in which um, they're going to take the image? Right, so metal, well, the hips are right next to the, you know, the prostate sits between the two hips. And so if people have a metal hip replacement, that can definitely degrade the image quality. Some say that you can use a 1.5 Tesla with a lower field strength, and this is above my pay grade. Useful images can still often be obtained even with hip replacement, but the uh, images won't be as sharp. So when we talk about MRIs, you know, we have the images that are taken, but we also have the people reading the images. And I think a lot of times pa patients are wondering how accurate is that? Is, is, you know, do they need to go to a center of excellence to make sure they're getting a quality MRI and a quality person reading the images? Does there need to be a second overread to make sure that um, it's accurate in its reporting? It is tricky to read MRIs in an optimal way. Uh, one expert told me it takes 500 to 1,000 practice reads to be really proficient. In cases where people are having MRIs done at unknown facilities where the reputation is not clear, or perhaps they don't have a large volume of prostate MRIs, uh, you can have the images uh, stored on a disk and sent to a center of reference. On the West Coast, we use UCLA often. On the East Coast, we send uh, patients to uh, Cornell. In New York, what the doctors who have experience reading these will say, they'll look at, not only interpret the images, but they'll also look at the image quality and tell you if the MRI that was used is generating images that are good enough to interpret. And if they are, then they can overread it and provide confidence that the readout is, is accurate. Problems with people making mistakes on MRIs at at garden variety centers around the country, it's a real issue. And uh, double checking is often a very prudent thing to do. How often does an MRI have the possibility of missing a significant cancer? So well-performed MRIs read by experts can probably miss small significant cancers uh, in about 10% of people. Significant means that if you uh, did a biopsy that it would have a Gleason score of above three plus three. and significant in a clinical sense, it may be something different because small, higher grade lesions are still very low propensity for metastasis. And it, significance in the cancer world, including the prostate cancer world, has to do with whether or not it has or will spread. One way to circumvent this limitation with um, uh, missing 10% of significant cancers is to ensure that people get annual screening because the the ones that are going to be consequential will over time will grow and at some point become detectable, in my opinion, almost always before they are metastasized, still while they're treatable and curable. So when you say annual screening, are we talking about PSA and MRI together? Screening is perhaps not the right word. Screening is where people are otherwise healthy and they're going in to check and see if there's something brewing. Annual follow-up of someone that's had screening, let's say someone had an MRI and his PSA is running high, the idea of doing an MRI and saying, it's clear, we're done, is probably a little bit cavalier. In fact, many doctors will then go on and do other testing with OPCO or XODX, or they'll go on and do a random biopsy just to be sure, but I th think that kind of defeats our purpose of trying to circumvent these random biopsies, which are kind of unpleasant. Annual checkups after having had an MRI that is um, normal is a prudent thing to do, especially if someone's running a high PSA. That's probably the reason that they've had a, an MRI is because their PSA is on the high side. And yes, in those individuals, we would continue to check the PSA probably every six months and uh, use that information as well to decide what next steps would be appropriate. When we talk about PSMAs, we always say that, you know, you can see prostate cancer after 0.5. Is there a, you know, certain situation with PSA and MRIs where you're definitely going to, pot, you know, see cancer tumors on the prostate if the PSA is over a certain threshold? Well, in men that still have their prostates, uh, PSMAs came on the scene to try and help people that had a radical prostatectomy, now their PSA is rising, where is the cancer located? But PSMA PET scans are also good for staging newly diagnosed people, and they can be a consideration to circumvent doing a random biopsy in people that have uh, an elevated PSA undergo an MRI and then a, a suspicious lesion is detected. Those individuals could consider doing a PSMA PET scan to see if that lesion lights up because the PSMA PET scan is disease specific. Presumably, if the PSMA PET scan doesn't light up in that area, then that 
that shadow that was detected on MRI isn't consequential prostate cancer. So this kind of begs the question, and I see this oftentimes in the comments section, and even just talking to patients, they're wondering, why would you just not get a PSMA scan first? Why, what is the benefit of getting an MRI first? MRI is a little bit more precise inside the prostate than PSMA. MRI doesn't have any radiation exposure. MRI is covered by insurance, whereas PSMA is only covered in men who have uh, been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and it's expensive, you know, $5,000, something in that range. So there's a lot of reasons that we don't screen with PSMA. I would say if it was covered by insurance, we'd still be reluctant to do something that exposes people to radiation when we have a MRI scan that doesn't incur any radiation whatsoever. When someone gets an MRI, are, are we seeing the entire prostate? Are we seeing the front side, the back side? Is there anything that is missed that, you know, we kind of have in question? No, that's, of course, one of the advantages of MRIs over random biopsies. Random biopsies typically sample the posterior half of the prostate, which is next to the rectum. It's not a bad area to sample because that's where 90% of the cancers occur. But uh, they will miss the front of the prostate and MRIs don't. MRIs see the whole gland. It's part of the reason in head-to-head -head studies they've been shown to be more accurate than random biopsies. And are MRIs pretty accurate in detecting seminal vesicle invasion and anything that where the, the you know, cancer is leaking outside of the prostate? Seminal vesicle invasion, yes quite accurate. Extracapsular extension, which is talked about a lot in the reports, and it's very much on the surgeon's mind because uh, he then has to be concerned when cutting the prostate out to leave extra space, and that may make it more difficult to do ner nerve sparing surgery. So they're always leaning over the radiologist's shoulder, is there extracapsular extension? Um, and patients tend to also wonder, because you'll see in the reports that the doctor will say there is or there isn't, or maybe there is or maybe there isn't. And patients are often wondering if this somehow relates to a worse form of cancer. It sounds much worse. Spreading out the edge of the prostate, more aggressive. It doesn't create problems for treating with radiation because they can just uh, spray over the edge of the gland a little bit wider and achieve better cure rates. So extracapsular extension often is something people pay a lot of attention to in reading these MRI reports, and I'm sure it's relevant for patients who are thinking about doing surgery. I'm not a fan of surgery, so in my day-to-day -day world, it doesn't play a very big role. Thank you so much to all of you who have left comments and questions in our comment section. It helps us to create content just like this, so if you have further questions, go ahead and leave them in the comment section below this video. And if you have further questions on MRI or anything particular to your case, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through this whole process and they are a wealth of information and they're a really great way to get you ready for your medical appointments and get your questions answered. So you can find out more again at PCRI. Org. Now please click that subscribe button because when you do this it's a great way to support our channel and give us a thumbs up if this video was helpful for you. And just please remember most of all, you're not alone. I hope you have a great week.